Welcome to my talk. Uh, today we'll be talking about time travel, gradual typing in C++. And um, I am sorry to disappoint, but there we go. Uh, we already have an existence proof that time travel isn't actually a thing, right? Because if it were a thing, all of those misconfigured time machines would have shown up at the beginning of the epoch, <laughs> right? So. Um, like, don't, uh, so sadly, we're back to uh, just gradual typing in C++. So that's, um, sorry if I've missold you on this talk. Um, let me make a bold assertion at the beginning of this talk uh, that C++ is a dynamically typed language. Um, how many people here believe this? All right, I see a couple of people, right? Um, I also see your, your battle scars, right? Uh, so I will weaken this assertion a little bit by saying that C++ lets you write dynamically typed code. Okay, so uh, like the language itself may be statically typed, like the language may do appropriate type checking for you, but you can still uh, defeat that in marvelous and wonderful ways, right? So uh, let's start, let's think about an example. So if we wanna have a simple string class, right? So the, the first thing here is you see the word union and you all should be like cringing, right? Um, so this is a, a simple string class. It uses uh, the short string optimization, right? So in some cases we have like pointer plus length, and, but if we have a short string, we want to keep that all in the same uh, cache line, so we, we have a, a buffer just to hold that, right? And of course, the next thing we do is we write an API that uses this thing, right? So uh, S should always have data set, right? So like, if you call this function, you should always have this precondition met. And like, okay, so the first thing someone will do is do this, right? They will call the function without the precondition being met, okay? Like, there's nothing in the language that prevents you from doing this, right? So like we're writing dynamically typed code in a statically typed language, right? Because like this type up here, this union is dynamically typed. It can be one thing or the other. And this function accept, it, it expects you to pass one thing, but you're instead passing the other. So uh, this is the point at which I am uh, contractually obligated to point this out, right? This is Hiram's law, uh, which I won't read it to you because enough people have done that this week already. Um, essentially, it means that if someone can abuse your API, they will. Okay, um, again, like this is, should be fairly uh, obvious to folks that maintain large enough systems that like somebody is always going to be doing um, something that they, like as long as they can, they will be doing it, right? So how do we prevent this, right? So we may, like in this case, maybe we add a struct that has the appropriate Boolean flag and then we wrap it all up in a class and hide all that stuff from our user so that that way like we have a single class that we're passing around that maintains invariance and all of a sudden we can use the facilities of the language to get rid of this like dynamically typed code problem. Right, so uh, why do we have types, right? So we, we, like it gives us this types, and I would say that we have types because types essentially encode constraints, right? Types are a way that allow us to encode limitations on what you can do with data or values in, this, in, in C++. Right, so if, if we didn't want to have any limitations, everything would be an int, or everything would be a char, right? Because like no limitations, you can do anything you want there. But like types restrict what we can do, they encode these constraints, and that gives us a lot of power. It gives us the ability to reason about higher order things in our, in our uh, software. It lets the compiler reason about it in, in, in other ways, right? These come at a cost. If you watched Chandler's talk a couple weeks ago, or a couple days ago, right, these come at a cost. Uh, and that cost, as Titus pointed out a couple days ago as well, is in refactorability, right? So like, we like types, but because they give us these constraints, but there is a cost. But in most cases, right, the costs outweigh, or the benefits outweigh the costs, and we're happy to use types. So back to dynamically typed software. Uh, what is this? Right? Audience participation time. Like, what is this? It's an integer. Like, what does I represent? Number of horses, okay. <laughs> right, like it could. I mean, there's nothing that there's there's nothing in the language that prevents us from like using this in that way, right? It's just an integer. There's no semantic information attached to i in this case. What's that? It, it, it could be negative. It could, could be number of horses. Oh, it could be negative, right? Because like you know, a number of horses uh, could be negative, right? Well, you know, I mean, they're imaginary horses, so maybe I don't, you know. Um, so, so anyway, uh, back off of horses. Um, 
So we can rename this variable, okay? We rename it something like timeout, right? Maybe that may, it may, uh, maybe that may give us more contextual information about uh, what this means, okay? Uh, and if we're really good, we'll even put a comment on it, right? Expiration time. Any idea what this represents now? Number of horses in timeout. Number, <laughs> number of horses in timeout is the, uh, is the response. I'm gonna stop listening to that half of the room. Okay, um, what else? Any, any other ideas? Right. Whether or not you hit the, hit the expiration time. Okay, that statement is actually a Boolean statement. Okay, because whether or not is a Boolean expression. Um, but yeah, you can think about this as like the amount of time until some operation expires, right? Um, or you could think about it as the time at which an operation should expire. Right? These are actually two different semantic concepts and yet we're using our friend int to represent them both. Uh, we can also do things like this, right? The language lets us do this, right? Sorry, it's not number of horses, right? Um, <laughs> number of pumpkins, right, is timeout plus five, right? We're in kind of harvest season um, in, in Pittsburgh where I'm from, right? So uh, number of toothbrushes is six times timeout, right? Like the language does not prevent us from doing any of these terrible things. Now, code review, you all do code review, yes? Okay, code review should prevent like, egregious violations of like semantic knowledge that like this, right? But like, you know, you, you kind of don't want to depend on that. Um, so let's look at another example, right? So we have our friend timeout here, set deadline, okay? Takes an integer. What, is it, what does it represent, right? Some period of time until something expires, right? Set timeout, right? Why do we have two different functions? Maybe they mean two different things, who knows? We add some comments, because comments prevent people from doing poor things, right? Like, <laughs> Consider the source, right? Like what, comments, make sure that people don't abuse your API, right? Uh, so, like we have, you know, this this it worked last time, right? So um, someone starts calling this function. You know, so set deadline, right, is documented to be a a uh, you know thing that like set it for some time period in the future, right? Or set we're trying to set it 30 seconds from now, right? This violates the comment. You know, who knows what's going to happen. Um, even better is if set, set deadline is actually implemented like this. So we think we're setting a deadline for 30 seconds into the future, or setting a timeout, sorry, for 30 seconds into the future. And yet, even though we got like the kind of thing correct, we got the scale wrong. And so instead we're setting a, de a, a deadline for you know, 30 milliseconds into the future, okay? So this is actually a common thing with time. Right? There's a lot of other domains where you could think that like this is a bad thing. Um, this happens in, in time types uh, a, a fair amount, right? Um, and so we don't like this property. Um, so uh, a few years ago, STD Chrono is now in the standard library. Um, at Google, we use the Abcell Time libraries, which provide similar functionality um, to avoid this very thing, right? So if I have code that looks like this, right, I'm setting a deadline. And, or, or sorry, I have a function and it interacts with times in different ways, right? Some of them are relative, some of them are absolute times, right? I'm doing arithmetic, I'm doing all this stuff. Like, like this code like may be correct, but like the type system in C++ doesn't actually enforce correctness in any way, right? We're on our own. Um, hopefully you're, maybe you have tests, hopefully you're doing code review, but like we're on our own. What we would really like is to actually use the language Surprise, right? To actually enforce some of these things. We'd like to be able to have stronger type guarantees. We'd like to be able to, to, do, to, to be able to reason about these um, statically, right? And so we'd like to have code that looks like this, uh, where I'm using, so duration is the abcell type that represents an interval in time. Uh, time is the abcell time type that represents an instant in time. We'll talk about those a little bit more later. But like this is actually doing arithmetic in, you know, the, the, like the proper domain, it prevents you from doing things that you shouldn't be able to do, right? If you're trying to add two times together and come up with a time that's a lot more in the future than now, I don't know. Like that's actually nonsensical. And so like the, the type system will, will, will protect you here, right? So I won't go too deep into that because uh, in 2015, a colleague of mine, Greg Miller, gave uh, a talk called Time Programming Fundamentals here at CPPCon, you should go watch it. Um, because it talks about the nuances of time programming and like the differences actually between like time uh, like time types and like actually like calendars and and civil time and these kinds of things. Um, and there's a bunch of stuff in there that's like kind of fundamental for time programming. So um, if you 
uh, haven't seen that talk, but like, let's review a couple of things real quick. So the Absale time library, uh, it models time as a one-dimensional affine space. Okay, I have no idea what this means, but no. Uh, like an affine space, is, you can imagine it as a number line, right? So it's just a number line from negative infinity to positive infinity. Uh, there is no zero point, right? So there's no Unix epoch in, in that sense. Um, like these va these variable these types do have obviously default values, but like as a user of them, you really shouldn't like rely on them. Um, there's there's because like time itself doesn't have necessarily a zero point if unless you count like the Big Bang, right? Like there's no zero point on that timeline. Um, time instants are absolute time. Time intervals are absolute duration. Uh, and once we have this this type system, we can actually think about uh, different operations in that system, right? We can use the the algebra of affine spaces to define what's possible and what's not within and between those types, right? So if I add a time and a duration, you know, if I say 30 seconds from now, right, obviously that's another point in time. If I say uh, 30 seconds plus another 30 seconds, you know, I hit the add 30 seconds button on my microwave, right? That, that's, that's another, that's, that yields another duration. So I have two durations, yields another duration. Um, what's interesting here is that there's actually undefined behavior, or not behavior, sorry, that's a technical term of art. Um, there's undefined operations. Uh, so a time point plus a time point doesn't actually mean anything. So I can't say, what is today plus tomorrow? Like that's a nonsensical like question to ask. And the type system actually doesn't allow you to ask that question. It would be a compile time error. I am very happy when I can turn runtime errors into compile time errors, right? Um, and, and having a stronger type for these concepts lets us do that. Uh, there's other things you can do too, right? So like there's, uh, you know, duration can be multiplied by a scalar and that gives another duration. So I can say, I will wait twice, you know, colloquially you might think of that as saying, I will wait twice as long. So I'm waiting for a minute. I will wait twice as long. That gives me two minutes. Uh, you can do division by scalar. You can like find what's the relationship between two durations, right? So division of two duration, uh, durations. Um, you can do comparison between uh, time and time. I, you can do comparison between duration and duration. In fact, it's nonsensical to do comparison between like duration and time or duration and int. So 30 seconds, if I want to compare 30 seconds to 20, that's actually an undefined operation. Like I, I need to be able to compare a duration with another duration. Um, there's also things that here like that aren't, I, I omitted them, but like you can't multiply time by a scalar, right? So, you know, uh, 2020 times two, like that, you know, 40, 40, like, like that doesn't mean anything in a, in a domain in which there actually, actually isn't a zero point, right? So like these operations are all defined uh, in the abcell, in, in, in abcell time um, and others aren't. And that's that, that, the fact that others aren't is actually powerful as part of this process. Uh, there are various conversion functions. So you can convert from an integer or a double to a duration. Um, these are actually defined for stuff uh, for other uh, scales beyond just minutes, seconds, and milliseconds. I'll use those as you know for convenience, but like nanoseconds, microseconds, hours, right? These are always, you know, it's got a full um, range of, of scales for conversion. Uh, you can go back to double and int. And so like what this means is by having these conversion and factory functions that we can migrate stuff piecemeal, right? So the whole goal of this entire process is to be able to migrate old code that's using integers and doubles to represent time to use proper types to represent time and either find bugs or like just improve future maintainability. Uh, and we want to be able to do that incrementally, which means we need to be able to convert at the boundaries, right? And so having conversion functions lets us do this. Uh, same thing with abcell time uh, and as opposed to duration. Um, most, by the way, most of the examples that I'll use will be duration centric, but time, it's like the time type has a similar analog, right? So uh, we can think about doing conversions from uh, in this case, from, we're, we're, we're declaring a, a, a particular epoch, right? So from Unix seconds to an abcell time. Um, and if you wanted to, you could convert those back to Julian seconds, right? Because you're picking a, a zero point as part of the conversion uh, process. So um, that's kind of a brief overview of, of abcell time. Gradual typing, right? So the other half of the, 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 uh, the, the title of the talk. So gradual typing is this, this notion that we're going to take uh, some type information, and we're gonna to try to propagate it through our system. So this is a term that, that comes up a lot in dynamically typed languages. So Python, for instance, has added uh, type annotations as part of the language. Now those aren't checked at runtime, those are checked by, by static checking or static analysis tools. But Python has added these, this ability to add 
uh, type information to your, your program. And so what you can do in Python is you can say like, oh, hey, uh, I have a function that's being called. And everywhere I'm calling that function, I'm calling it with a, like the first argument is a string. And a gradual typing tool can say, maybe that argument should be annotated as only accepting a string. And it will go through and add that annotation, right? And this is really useful because the next time you go to call that function, you can, it'll error if you try to give it anything other than a string, right? Now this is this has obviously obvious downsides um, in that it's using existing context, right? What if you just happen to be passing strings, but other things are valid? Uh, what if you know you you aren't passing? You should only be passing strings, but you aren't, right? These inference tools uh, kind of describe the state of the world as it is, but maybe not the state of the world as you wish it to be. And that's that's essentially what we're going to be doing with time types um, in this work with C++. Uh, so in order to do that, right, to, to propagate time information and type stronger type information through our C++ code base, we have a few goals. Uh, we want to be able to automate everything, almost everything, right? We want to be automated as much as possible because uh, I, on a code base the size of Google's, right, we're talking about, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of, of instances. We want to automate as much as we possibly can. Uh, we want to make sure everything's buildable at incremental steps, right? So we might not be able to, we, we are go not going to be able to propagate type information straight through everywhere. Uh, and so we're gonna have to do this incrementally. Um, we're gonna have to do a multi-step process. Again, if you look, watch Titus's talk from a couple weeks or a couple days ago, uh, a multi-step process. We wanna make sure that everything's still buildable at, that, at incremental steps. We wanna make sure that everything's still readable at in incremental steps, right? We don't wanna produce code that like a human would look at and say like, that's terrible code uh, and just have to say like, oh, well, trust us, it'll get better, right? Like that actually doesn't fly very well with most, most reviewers. Um, and what we would like is we would like to eventually converge at a fixed point. We would eventually like to get to the point where our tools are running, but you know they're not fighting each other. Right? They eventually get to a point that that um, that that we have a final result. Um, so things that don't work, right? We can't do everything at once. Okay, just talked about that. You can't do everything at once. Um, we can't use the variable type to do our time conversion analysis, right? Because not every integer represents a time instant or a time duration. Not every double represents a time duration or a time instant. In fact, even if they like, even if they did, you know, does it, you know, integers represent both time durations and instants, right? Like, like how do we judge between the two, right? So we can't use, use just the variable type to do this kind of thing, right? Which is different again from some of the other type migration stuff that we have, that we've talked about in the past. We're just like, we're just trying to rename a type. Okay, in this case, we're not just renaming, we're adding like, stronger semantics to the type. And so we need the things like the conversion functions and whatnot, but we can't just use the, the, the spelling of the existing type to do the analysis. Um, we can't just use the name of the variable because like, what does timeout seconds actually mean, right? It could be a time point, it could be a duration, it could be misnamed, like I, you know, who knows, right? Um, like we don't actually know the name. And so we can use that as a hint in some cases, but we don't want to rely just on rename all the things that are suffixed seconds and call them durations, right? We don't want to do that. Um, you know, of course, our other option is to use comments, right? Like, and no, don't use comments, right? Like if you think that variable type is unreliable or uh, variable name is unreliable, like comments are going to be extremely unreliable, right? Like, um, if they're even there at all, right? So like we can't use comments to to infer um, stronger type information. Question? Yes. If your legacy code had tax um, time underscore t, which I think is an artifact of 1964, that wouldn't have any of this. Yes. So there are some things. Uh, so time. I, so repeat the question, right? So if your legacy code has time under bar t, like that might be a help. Yes. Uh, so time under bar t, you could use that as an analog for uh, a time instant, um, except for the fact that because it's just an in64, people actually don't always use it just as a time instant. Right? They may use it as a time under bar t, 30 seconds. Right? Like they may use it in a way that's interpreted as a duration and not just an instant. Right? Uh, you could use like calls to time, the, the the C standard, you could you could use calls to time as a signal, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, right? But like, you can't just use the type. Um, we actually have a type inside Google called wall time that's like documented and defined. To, it's a double, it's just a type def to double. It's like the number of seconds since the epoch. 
Um, if you think about that for a moment, it means that it is half as precise now than it was 20 years ago when it was introduced. Because it's a double, right? And we're about, you know, the epoch is almost 50 years ago, and so like we've added another digit to the to the the, the floating point represent. You know, it's just um, bad idea, right? But like it's documented to be number of seconds since the epoch, and yet people use it all over the place as an interval instead of uh, an instant. Um, right. So our general approach is going to be develop kind of a grab bag of tools and have them run across the code base like in, in parallel simultaneously, right? So a bunch of autonomous robots kind of running across the code base uh, that do very specific kinds of changes. And let's run through what some of these tools look like and then we'll talk about how we kind of integrate them into an autonomous system that does gradual typing, right? So um, we can do expression-based transformations. So we can do things like simplify an existing expression. Uh, you know, simplify comparisons, look at addition and subtraction, um, distribute uh, factory function calls and other kinds of function calls across uh, various operators. Uh, we can talk about, and, and most of these today, incidentally, uh, I think all of these are implemented up, upstream in uh, Clang Tidy uh, in the Appsail namespace. So like, you can go look at how these are implemented, and we'll look at, at uh, one of them uh, in a few minutes, but like all of them are upstream, you can play with them today. Uh, we can also do variable transformations, so like actually transforming the types of variables. So we simplify expressions, and that may give us additional information that we can then use to go simplify variables in a local scope, or maybe even in class scope, uh, or maybe even in global scope, right? There's actually not too much difference between global scope and local scope in terms of the tooling, uh, so we won't really bother with that, right? But like we can rewrite variable types, okay? And kind of push this information beyond just single expressions. Uh, we can also do interfunction. Uh, transformations, right? So we're talking about parameters and changing and adding overloads and changing return values. And like, this is actually really hard because of all the reasons that we talked about a couple days ago with, you know, if I add a overload, like does someone taking the address and now it's ambiguous and, you know, we're gonna hand wave away some of that right now, but like, um, you know, on a theoretical perspective, like we can change the type of functions based on some of the contextual information. So let's talk about simplification. Um, so we want to be able to simplify uh, our, our time expressions for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, it gives us, uh, it usually results in better code for the user, uh, but also cleans up the Clang AST. The Clang AST has a lot of nodes in it and it's really messy. And if we can simplify existing nodes, it means that other transformations have fewer patterns to match, right? They don't have to match the entire kind of universe of possibilities if we have a tool whose entire job is to simplify expressions to a well-known set. So for instance, you can think about uh, if I have an expression like this, right? So I'm uh, constructing a, and by the way, this is all slide code. I have no guarantees about whether it compiles. I don't know if the down arrow is an actual operator in C++ or. You know. <laughs> um, so uh, Richard, it's coming in like C++ 23. No, um, all right, so um, that'd be awesome, right? You know, migrate my code, this is how, right? Um, so. <laughs> Uh, it's a shorthand for go-to. Yeah, it's a shorthand for go-to, yes. Um, so uh, if I have an integer that represents the number of seconds and I'm calling, say, the milliseconds factory function and I'm multiplying that integer by 1,000, then like this is clearly, you know, based on just this, not the name of the variable, based on just the expression inside of the factory function, I can rewrite this to be a factory call to seconds instead of milliseconds, right? This is a cleaner kind of thing. It removes the multiplication, which is, you know, happy for efficiency purposes, but it also, um, makes it easier to match this, this second expression, the, the simplified expression in other tools. Um, we can also do things like remove static cast, right? So the factory functions take both, uh, have overloads for both floating point types as well as integer types. This static cast here is now superfluous. Uh, in fact, it's a pessimization because the floating point version is a little bit less performant, or has a, is worse in performance than the integer, integer version. Um, and so we can remove the static cast and that gives us the same result. In fact, if we remove the static cast, right, you can start to see that doing one simplification actually yields input for another type of simplification, right? And so we have these, we can run this tool kind of like continuously in the background over our code base. And whenever a, a pattern pops up that we want to simplify, the tool will just say, aha, we should simplify this, generate a change, go through the standard testing process and get it submitted, right? So we can, we can automatically do all this. Yes, question. 
Um, yes and no, right? So the question was, are they different atomic commits? And they, in initial kind of iterations of this process, they were. Uh, the way that our analysis tooling works, um, in some cases they need to be. But today, uh, these are implemented as clang tidy checks that run at code review time. And so uh, if an engineer like types one of like this thing into their into a, a change that they're making, the tool will run at code review and say like, ah, oh, you should have typed this instead, mash the button, and it updates the code for them. So it doesn't have to be committed. Um, some of the other more complex changes do actually need to be committed because like of the way that the our pipeline pipelines work and things like this, right? But um, but these do not have to be. Uh, all right, so like uh, this talk advertised that uh, you would get some playing tooling, uh, you know, would be using lib tooling. So like now truth in advertising, right? So um, this is uh, like the matcher that finds all of the you know, for, for that cast, remove the casts, right? So like, uh, and, and I'm even like leaving a bunch of stuff out here because if you think about like, this is calling uh, this duration factory function, which is a whole nother function that's like yielding the right sets of functions that we're trying to match. And, um, you know, we, we match against different, we have to match against several different kinds of casts, right? Not just static cast, it could be, you know, functional cast or it could be a, a, a C style cast, heaven forbid, C style cast, right? Um, you know, we actually even in the same tool we match against floating point literals because if you're calling like seconds, you know, one dot zero, we can actually trim the dot zero and just give you seconds one, which um, actually has a const expert constructor for various technical reasons. Um, so you can get a like a constant, uh, uh, you can get a, a, a compile time constant there instead of a runtime constant. And so, um, so we want to be able to simplify this, right? So that's the uh, that's the thing that matches, okay? And uh, if you don't understand all this, like, good for you, <laughs> right? Um, suffice it to say that the way that Clang Tidy and, and the Clang AST matching infrastructure works is this essentially like, this is essentially a functional style language that matches various nodes in the AST, right? So we're just matching various nodes in the AST. Uh, and then because the other stuff is actually like way too big to actually uh, show on the screen if I do this right, if I do this right, Ah, uh, I didn't do it right, but I can do it right here, actually. Um, okay, so like, what are we actually doing here? We're actually like, uh, this is the, so this is the, um, we're matching, we, we have our, uh, sorry, this is the, 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 this is the thing that does the rewriting, right? So like, we have a node, we think we can, we can rewrite it, we actually pass it into this function, which is a library function because we want to use it other places, uh, we want to compose this into other tools that we have. And so we're looking at like, if I've matched any of these things, then go get the, the context of it and return it. But if I don't, then I return LVO. I mean, like, this just gets really complex really fast. Um, I don't expect you to understand all this. Like I said, it's open source, it's upstream. If you really want to know, like, go dig into it. Um, but like, the point here being that like, these tools get, uh, can get unwieldy really quick, right? But like, that's the, that's the goal. Let's see if I can get my slides back here. Yes. Uh, that's not what I want. Even better. Nope. I want to full screen this puppy. All right. Uh, that may be as full screen as we get, but that's okay. Um, ah. Okay. So, and now I've got a search box. Ah. I can't even see the. Something is broken. Okay, so let's go back to, let's, there we go, okay. So, there we go, yeah, just gesticulate. I'll just wave my hands wildly and like that'll make it go away. Um, so the next thing we can look at is, is comparison, right? So we can compare, uh, we, we know when we're doing comparisons, for instance, that if we are comparing um, the, if we have a, a, a um, uh, if we have a duration expression on one side, then we should also be comparing against duration on the other side. So for example, we are um, doing this type of, like we, we are converting from a duration on the left-hand side of the expression, and we know that the right-hand side should also be a duration, right? Because comparisons are only well-defined between two durations. And so instead of doing the comparison in the, inter in the numeric domain, we're doing the comparison in the, we can switch to doing the comparison in the, the uh, uh, duration domain, right? 
So like this is, we can do this on time, we can do it in, 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 in duration as well, right? So this is another expression simplification we can do. Um, now let's think about addition. So from uh, like high school algebra, we know that if we have two things, if we're doing an addition, right, a plus b equals c, or if we write it in c plus plus, yeah, c equals a plus b, uh, like we know that if we have at three things and we have a single unknown, right, we can solve for that unknown, right? Like this, you know, eighth grade algebra, ninth grade algebra. Um, we can do the same thing for types in this context. So remember this this chart, right? Like if we have one, if we have two of these types in this chart in any given row, then we know what the other type is. Okay? So, and, and there's even a couple here where we only have to know one of the types because the operation is undefined if it's the other type, right? So like we can actually use that information to do addition transformations, right? So in this case, we're saying I have a result that is a time, okay? The, the, I'm converting from an addition that's happening in the integer domain, or in the, in the double domain in this case, right? That's a, a, a thing plus a thing that's being converted from a duration, right? Everyone follow that? So I can actually infer that the other thing, right, this time seconds thing here, is itself a time, because the only operation that's defined for types in this way is that the other operand is a time. And so instead of actually doing all these conversions up here, what I can do is I can unwrap the conversions and just convert the first operand of the addition. And then I'm doing the addition in the time, the you know, time slash duration domain, okay? And like this actually means I can do future expression simplifications or other simplifications based on for this first argument, right? This first operand. Um, because some operations are undefined, we can actually like do some additional inference, right? So in this case, I have a, a place where I'm converting from a time and then adding it to a thing. Because the only thing that I can add a time to is a duration, I can infer that that second operand must be a duration. And more importantly, or and also, because I'm converting from a, a thing that's scaled by seconds, I'm converting to the second scale, I can infer that other second operand must also be converted in the second scale, right? And then I convert the entire result of the expression back to the integer domain for the result. Okay, now this looks like longer code, right? This looks like, oh no, my code is worse, right? But in reality, what this is giving us is safer addition because we're only, now we're using our, our type safe kind of addition here. But it's also giving us additional information about the variable x. It's also giving us additional information about the variable result. And we'll talk about what that what we can do in a few minutes. Subtraction works kind of the same way, right? I can look at the different operands. I can infer information about them. And I can make the relevant transformation. Uh, and subtraction also can do things like if I'm subtracting two things that are converted from a duration, right? I know that the result also must be a duration. And so I just do that subtraction in the duration domain and then convert it back to an integer at the end, right? I mean, so like there's a number of these tools that are doing these kinds of interesting, you know, we can we can make these expression simplifications. The, another kind of simplification we can do is distribution. So the factory functions distribute across various other operations within the type system. So for instance, if I have a ternary operator and I'm converting the result to a duration, I can actually convert each part of the ternary, each branch of the ternary operator to a duration independently. In many cases, practically, one of these things is like zero or some constant, right? And that, because this is a const expr factory function, right, it's, I'm now doing that for free on that side of the branch. Whereas on the, if I'm converting on the outside of the ternary operator, I'm always doing the conversion at runtime. Uh, we can also think about, convert, it also distributes across things like std max, right? Uh, where, I can, where I can, push that factory function through the call to std max to the different arguments of, of max. Uh, what also happens is the tools are smart enough to recognize when I'm going from a duration to a double back to a duration, right? I can just like, it's like, you know, matter and antimatter, they collide and annihilate, and I can just get rid of the, the conversion altogether. And I can just use, in this case, just use y instead of both, um, you know, instead of having seconds, two double seconds of y, I can just move them both and I have the same thing. Um, Interesting thing that happens when you do this, by the way. Uh, duration and double have different levels of precision. 
and some people depend. <laughs> on the level of precision. Uh, I will make no moral judgments about those types of people in this forum. Come talk to me afterwards. Uh, right, so the next thing we can do. Um, so we can also, once we have our expression simplified, we can look at code like this and we can say, wait a minute, this timeout seconds is being initialized by converting from a duration and scaled appropriately, right? Maybe it should itself be a duration, okay? So we can, like, we now have, we have a tool that will run through and say, like, go find variables that have this property, right? They're being initialized by a conversion from a duration. Like, make those variables a duration. So do this, essentially. Make those variables a duration, and then I have to go rewrite the other references to those variables to, so that the code still compiles. So in this case, I'm converting back to a double on this if statement. I'm converting back to a double at the call to bar because that's what bar expects. Uh, when I'm doing the assignment in the next line, I have to convert on the right-hand side of the equal sign. Like I can't do the conversion on the left-hand side of the equal sign. I have to do the conversion on the right-hand side of the equal sign. Right? But again, now I have const expert here, right? That makes this, this abcell seconds 10 is essentially free. Um, I mean, the assignment still has to happen, but like the expression to compute abcell seconds time is essentially free. Um, but you'll notice what happened here is now I have a place where I could do, you know, my, con my comparison conversion tool will run through my code base, right? And it'll find this thing and it will, this thing in the if statement, right? And it will then, uh, say, hey, you should be comparing in the duration domain, and it will rewrite that to look like what we saw just a minute ago, right? So that the that the seconds is being hap it's converting the 30 to seconds instead of doing this two double seconds business. Um, that's the slide I just showed. Yes, yes. Uh, oh, no, this isn't the slide I just showed. Um, what's different? Anyone notice? I didn't notice. No, we've changed the name. Right, so right here we have absolute duration timeout seconds. Right, well that's actually somewhat nonsensical because durations don't have a scale. Right, they only have a scale. It's like you know they only have a scale when you observe them. Right, when you convert them into some other thing. Okay, so in this case this duration doesn't have a scale. So we'd really, I mean, if a human was writing this code, they wouldn't call it timeout seconds. They'd just call it timeout. Well, as part of our local variable rewriting tools, we just find places where it makes sense and like strip off the suffix so that it looks like a human wrote it. Right? I mean, that's what you would write if you were writing this. And so we want to be able to write this code as much as, as, much as possible as like a human would do it. Um, we can do the same thing for class member variables, right? So like in this case, uh, I'm, I'm not initializing by a conversion from a duration. I'm actually converting the variable to be a duration for a subsequent function call, right? This is another signal that that variable, that class member should be a duration. Like it's morally and semantically equivalent to a duration. And so what do we do? We uh, give it a, or we can take this line right here, uh, or the, that bottom line that call to bar, and we can say, we can infer that timeout seconds should itself be a duration. We can rewrite the name, and we can end up with this. Right? Um, this starts to get a little bit tricky, right? Because where are variables usually de declared, right? They're usually declared in header files. Where are they often used? We have to rewrite all the references to that variable. They're often used in .cc files, right? Um, you know, the, dot, the header file is like part of a lot of different translation units because it's included in presumably places where it's being used. Um, the .cc file is its own translation unit, but it turns out the header file is also part of the .cc as part of being included, right? And so there exists a translation unit for which all of you could do all these things for private variables. If you're doing public variables, like all bets are off, right? This gets much harder. But for private variables, like you can do these rewrites because there exists a translation unit for which they're, both of them are visible in the same translation unit. Um, so we've talked about variables, right? Now let's push it out a, a little bit farther, right? So even in this case, um, we can see that like, hey, I'm converting like this timeout parameter to the function to the constructor, right? I'm converting that from a to a duration. Maybe it itself should be a duration, right? So you can think about that's the next logical step here. Um, so in this case, we have function do it, function foo. Function foo is calling do it with a conversion from a duration as the second argument. And that can tell us that like, hey, maybe that second argument is, is again, morally a duration. We should do that conversion. 
Um, note that because we have, so, so we can do that conversion here. Note that because we are nowhere, nowhere are we using like the first argument. Now, you and I may look at this and say, hey, that first argument should be, is, is, is a time instant, right? We should convert that as well. And I would agree, but the tools don't know that, right? They're conservative enough that they can't tell that that's the case, right? Even this addition expression, right? Start time could be, per the type system, a duration or an instance. So we can't infer that addition expression. We can't simplify that, that particular addition expression further, right? Now, to this earlier point, right? We have a call to time, right? That itself is, yields a time instant. And we might be able to use, in fact, we could use that as the third variable in our type algebra to infer what this other addition should do. Right? And eventually back that out and figure out, the, you know, figure, infer the type of the, of the first argument and do it. Um, that's kind of turning the crank a few times and getting through this iterative process. Uh, we can also do it with returned values. So here I'm returning a value and I'm in the return statement. I'm converting from a dur duration to a deadline or to, to a double. Well, maybe the return value should be a duration instead of a double, right? You kind of get the theme here. We're, we're looking at context of specific uses of variables or parameters or return values, and we're using that to infer how we can modify the function or the variable or the expression, right? So in this case, we get to, uh, we can simplify it, it looks like this, right? We still have to adapt the caller to convert back to a double because we didn't, you know, it needs to be say it's still safe and able to compile. The nice thing about doing interfunction transformations is that when you do that, you influence, you, you, you can spread information laterally through the code base, right? Because when I change the, the type of a function parameter, because I've been, you know, if, if function A can give me information about the type of parameter for function B, then I now know a bunch of information about everyone who calls B, not just the, the first function that I was able to infer that type information from. Everyone who calls B, right? That, that, that argument should not, right? C++ lets you write dynamically typed code. Um, it should not uh, be different for different callers. Uh, now, I can tell you by experience that it is, but it shouldn't be. And so we can use that information to infer across, laterally across the code base for all the callers of B. Now, that's really, a, that's a nice property, but it's also a really terrible property for maintenance reasons and for migra like migrating, actually, actually enacting and using that property is really hard, right? So in practice, we usually add an overload, uh, you know, migrate callers piecemeal, and, and, and again, multi-step migration. Uh, go listen to Titus's talk from a couple days ago. So we've built up this, this tool set. We've built up this set of tools that we can use to do type migration, right? To do this gradual typing. We have all these tools kind of running across our code base. Um, some of them run automatically, like the expression-based stuff. Some of them uh, are not quite automatic, right? They require a human to run a thing every couple of you know, days and mash a button, and then like, they go do their thing, right? Like that could be automated. Um, some of them are much harder because of the context. In fact, the tools that we've written today only do change return values in like for, for functions defined in the anonymous namespace. So you know that they're in the same, you can do an atomic thing in the same translation unit. Like we haven't yet gotten to the point where we can do this automatically like across a broad swath of the, of the code base, right? But, but how do we start this process, right? We've got all these tools running, right? But they need something to munch on, right? How do we start this process? Well, I can tell you, first of all, that there, there's already a num number of places where these things would pick up changes, right? Because of existing pre you know, code, right? The, kind of this heterogeneous environment. But we need to do, but generally we need to do a process called seeding, right? We seed type information throughout the code base. And the way that we do this is we look at what are some high value function calls, right? So we have an RPC framework. Uh, many users of the RPC framework call set deadline on the RPC object, right? Here I'm going to make an RPC. Here is the context object, call set deadline, and I will give you a value, and that's when, you know, if I don't get a result back, then like, uh, you know, expire the operation or whatever. Um, I should be able, like, I can manually add an overload to that thing, right? So I can identify a bunch of high value targets in my code base. I can manually add appropriate overloads, okay? Uh, and then I'm done, right? Because we actually have tools that will say, you can give it a configuration like this, right? You can say, here is the function name, and here is the argument, and here is the scale. Now go convert all the callers. So in this case, it would see set timeout 30, and it would migrate that to set timeout milliseconds 30, right? Automatically, no problem, okay? Um, what's even more fun is when you end up with things like this, right? Like 
set timeout, timeout seconds, right? Does anyone see the problem here? <laughs> right? Like, what was happening? They were calling a function that interpreted its argument as a number of milliseconds. But in all likelihood, the caller of this function thought the function was interpreting its argument as a number of seconds. Like, congratulations, you just got a timeout that's a thousand times longer than you expected. Okay? And, and my favorite response when, I, when people comment on this, like, hey, you introduced a bug. No. <laughs> the bug has always been there. Now you know about it. Right? Um, in fact, we have a tool inside of Google that will flag instances of just this pattern. Right? You are using a constructor, uh, the factory function, to millis like for milliseconds for a variable that looks like it is denominated in seconds. Like, are you sure you want to do that? Okay. Um, I actually, if people ask me to fix this bug, I tell them no, because uh, the bug pre-exists my change, right? And I don't want to change semantics in my migration. I want to keep my migration as semantic preserving as possible, right? Because the minute I start changing semantics, the minute their tests start failing, and I don't want that to be on me, right? So I let them worry about changing semantics later, but now they know about it. Right, this is really useful. Uh, it's even it's even more fun when like, right, like congratulations, you have just set a deadline that's like fifty thousand years into the future, right? Like, you know, because you have, or or you know, you, you or you've got this. Ah, I mean, like, um, these things happen, right? Like, what's going on here? Um, and yet, this that's the benefit of doing this type migration. Right? Like, what's the point of all this? Right? The point is finding bugs in your legacy code, finding bugs in, in existing code, and being able to then propagate that information so that when people read it, they know what's going on. When tools read it, they know what's going on. And when you go to change it or interact with it, right, you can use the modern types. So let's briefly go through a kind of a front-to-end example. Right? So how would we apply this? Remember that initial piece of code that I had? Right? So like this set deadline, seconds, blah, 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 right? All this stuff, right? Um, how would this happen, right? Well, the first thing we do is we'd add an overload from set deadline to have an abstract duration, okay? That's simple enough. Uh, that can happen not in the same file. That's like, can be something in some other translation unit. Um, once we have that, we can update our caller to use the factory, the right factory function to, so we're now calling the thing, the duration overload instead of the seconds overload. Once we've updated all those things, we can just remove the seconds overload. So now people have to call the duration overload. Right? This is great. Um, but this foo function here can be uh, improved. right? So what we're doing here is we're going to, the first thing we can do is we can change the type of deadline. We can infer that because, so going back here, right? we can infer that because deadline is being converted from nav-cell seconds, it should itself be a duration with scale of seconds. right? So we can change the initializer. We can change the places that it's referenced. We have to like convert back to a double in this bottom expression, right? But we can we can do all this using this set of this variable uh, transformation tools that we just talked about. Uh, well, what's next? Anybody have an idea? What's the next transformation we, we should do? Distribution. distribution, right? So let's do distribution. So we can push. Uh, is that what we did? No, we didn't do distribution. We did subtraction. So we could do distribution. Um, that is actually one of the things. Uh, that we could do, but instead we're going to look at subtraction because it actually has the outer thing. Note that like these tools are running simultaneously, and so they could actually fight each other and like try to which one goes first, right? Um, it does not matter. They will actually arrive at the same fixed point depending on which one does first. We're going to select subtraction here, but you could just as easily have done distribution through through SCD min. Um, so in this case, we're going to do subtraction. So we can infer the result at the bottom that we're just doing subtraction now in the time slash duration domain. Uh, and in the top part, we're doing subtraction just in the duration domain, right? So that there are two operands of durations. We can do subtraction, we're fine. And now we can do distribution, right? So now we can say the call to std min, I'm going to push the factory function through that call. So I'm going to have seconds on the one operand and uh, call to you know, wrap the call to deadline on the other operand. Okay, uh, what's next? Any ideas? There's actually a couple of them. The input argument, the input argument right? So like double offset or, or offset seconds, right? We're, we're converting that to a duration with scale seconds. And so we can go through and we can change the input argument. We can make that a duration. We can change the reference to offset. We can rewrite the name. I'm just saying offset, right? Uh, 
And now we can go back and through. Now we can say, like, well, we can also change the return type of this function. So we can change the return type to abseil time. Sorry, the highlighting's not there. Uh, we can return an abseil time directly instead of converting to an integer and then returning that integer, right? And the last thing we can do is we can infer the return type of deadline. So we can change deadline to be an abseil duration, re return abseil duration, and we can change its reference calls to deadline inside of the uh, function foo, right? So we have arrived completely autonomously at this ideal thing, right? We've gotten to the from the point all by adding manually one constructor. The rest of it's automatic. The rest of it's just a bunch of tools running through the code base, uh, iteratively kind of churning through these patterns, right? And pushing this type information through from one little kind of kernel through an entire function. And you can envision that if we've changed the return type of deadline here, there are a bunch of other callers to deadline that now have conversions at their call sites. And what's going to happen to those? Well, the type information is going to keep kind of propagating through their expressions and their functions and their, you know, and so like we'll eventually get to a point that, you know, we've propagated it through. There are certain boundaries, right? So like, uh, you know, output, input, these kinds of things, right? Like printf doesn't take a duration as a conversion uh, thing, right? Um, you could you know, have a, a you know, formatter that does, right? So it's pretty easy to do. Um, but you know, there are boundaries, and so we're just pushing this as far as we can uh, to those boundaries. Uh, so what, what do people think when we do this, right? We're gonna talk about this one. You've added a bug. Uh, oh, never mind. Uh, the bug's already there. Um, you know, people have been grateful, but generally, like, no sound, right? That's the best sound, right? Because it means that we've been able to do this without people knowing, right? And their code just gets better. Uh, that's ultimately what, like, this is a concrete example of like that happening, but ultimately, right, I think we're moving to a world in which quasi-autonomous or fully autonomous uh, tools are run, or should or can run through your code base and change your code in ways that are provably correct without you knowing. Right? And they increase your ability to find bugs, they increase your ability to understand your code, they increase the compiler's ability to reason about your code, they make it harder for you to write bugs. Right? You can't take it 30 seconds and multiply by five and get a number of pumpkins. Right? Um, this is like our code is now stronger and easier to reason about because we've been doing this process. Um, and you might look at this and say, like, well, this is a special case. Right? Like you only have this time has well-defined algebra, like there's a bunch of well-defined relationships, like how else can I use this, right? So um, potential other applications. I have not written any of these, uh, but I would like to see them written, right? So imagine a function that has, uh, that only ta that, that takes a const string ref or a string argument, but all it does with that argument is call things that take string pieces or uh, string views, right? All it does is, is convert that to string view everywhere within the function or only uses, it uses things that are in the string API, but also in the string view API. Right? Maybe the argument itself should be a string string view. Right? Do the analysis. Find out. Right? Push that better type information through the function call. Uh, ownership deduction. Okay. So before unique pointer, we just passed around raw pointers everywhere with comments saying you get ownership. Right? Well, we have seen how well that works out. Okay. So if I have, for instance, a function that is called many times. And maybe one of those callers is taking the result and putting it into a unique pointer. What does that tell me about the thing that's being returned from that function? I only need one caller to do this. And now I know that that function is returning a, a very, it's returning ownership of that pointer to its callees. Well, maybe it should be returning a unique pointer. You know, abstraction costs notwithstanding. Maybe it should, maybe it should be returning a unique pointer to better communicate ownership. I can do that analysis and push further use of ownership information through my code base, making it less likely people will have all the various pointer bugs that C++ is famous for. Right? So I would love to see these implemented. Um, please, you know, I, if you have another idea, I'd like to hear it. Right? Like I think that we can be building tools to better to, to use uh, stronger type information in our code bases in an, in a, in an iterative and, and, and incremental way. So. Um, if you want to see the tools that we've already implemented, uh, that's the uh, poorly line broken uh, URL for them. Um, 
But other than that, uh, I'm Hiram, and that's my talk. So if you have questions, please use the mic. For people that are interested in doing this, can you maybe discuss the the cost in terms of time or people? Like how, how hard was this for you to do before someone else tries to embark on this journey? So how hard was this for me to do? Um, huh. So uh, I have been working on this off and on for like the last two or three years. Uh, this is not my full-time job. So I won't say it's been full-time for the like two or three years. Uh, I also like, left Google for a little while and then came back. So like that stint didn't count and you know, it is, is not, you know, wasn't part of, I wasn't working on it during that period. Um, the hardest part is actually dealing with all the corner cases, right? Because there are cases where the tools, you know, so for instance, Clang Tidy doesn't give you a very good way of matching ref references to variables in Lambda captures, right? And so if we go rewrite all the variable references, we're going to rewrite stuff in Lambda captures and like that's going to fail compilation. I got to go update that manually, right? So like, Finding corner cases in the tooling, finding corner cases in the ecosystem. I mean, those are those are parts of like the ongoing cost of doing stuff like this, right? Um, I think that the you know coming up with a good uh, like writing the tools is hard, right? If you're not familiar with Clang, the Clang AST and the Clang Tidy tooling, like that's going to be the biggest thing. And then like developing the, the the logical framework to reason about. Fortunately, we have one of those because time has enough fine space and we have a mathematical model, right? But like thinking further about that model would be is part of the hardness of doing this. But yes. Hello, thank you for the talk. I've been working on Clang Tidy a bit myself, and I was thinking about a check that would add const in various places. It seems like an obvious thing to do. Like in general, it's really hard, but there are some things that you could do. Have you been thinking about this? Yes, so I haven't been thinking about that specifically, but certainly like if you're looking at propagating stronger type, type guarantees through a system, like constifying stuff is definitely something you can do. There are some nuances around constification that you may want to be aware of, but like, Generally, like this type of uh, approach would probably work in that case. Okay, and my second question is, the big problem still seems to be cross-translation unit replacements. Because yes. all the Clang Tidy stuff doesn't really take that into account. Do yes. you have some plans to work on that or some idea how that might look like? Um, I will agree that it's hard. Uh, I will also s agree that like we have people that are looking at cross-translation unit stuff within Google right now. Um, I'm not one of them. This is side project. Um, but I hope to leverage what they come up with. Okay, thank you. So. A question about the replacing the type in the class definition. Mm -hmm. um, the one issue that jumped out at me, having done similar things, is if any code has a dependency on the alignment or size of the class, um, any ideas on how to detect that or fix that or attribute that or otherwise handle that particular case? So if you have a dependency on the size of the class, right, you should encode that as a static assert. Or, or alignment. like Or alignment, right? Like, uh, encode that as a static assert. Uh, no, I, I, don't, I don't know, like, I, I, I do not know offhand uh, what the right tools in the toolbox would be to be, but like, encode your, 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 the assumptions that you make, right, should be encoded in a way that they are detectable. <laughs> Right, so like if I change the alignment and it matters to you, like your test should start failing. Right. Okay. If you don't encode that in a way that I can detect, then we're both gonna have a bad day. Okay. I was just wondering if there's anything in in that you're envisioning in terms of like mark a particular class, like hey, if the layout of this class changes, that you might have a bad day. No, nope, just good tests. Okay. So I totally agree that the code is better afterwards. Um, but I'm imagining going to my boss and saying, I'd like to spend two or three years of my <laughs> time on this. And I'm pretty sure the question would be, how do you justify this from a business standpoint? Right. And so I'm curious if you've measured code quality or, you know, rate of defects related to, you know, people misusing time types before so and after. I have made a list of like, uh, you know, bugs found. Uh, it's actually fairly small, um, which I'm happy about, but also sad about, right? Like. Um, I'm happy because it means that we don't have buggy code, right? I'm sad about because like I want my tools to be useful. Um, uh, I think I attribute that to like strong testing. That like you know lots of these things will show up in testing, and you know they fix the scaling issues and things like that uh, in, their, in their, as part of the testing. Um, I think more generally the argument you have to make is we should be able to change our software. Right? This is an application of that principle, but like we should be able to change our software, and 
there's a lot of reasons why you can make that argument, right? Whether it's, uh, you know, who knows when the next Spectre is gonna come out or whatever, right? Like our software cannot be immutable, right? Um, the big, biggest way, and this, happens, this is generally, like to figure out if I'm trying to apply a new engineering principle in an organization, like find instances where that principle cost, the lack of that principle cost real money, right? We had a bunch of outages because we didn't have good testing, right? Like here's how, you know, and that cost us half a million dollars last quarter. Right? Why don't we spend a bunch of time and a bunch of engineers implementing better testing practices? Right? We have a bunch of problems because our code is ossified to the point where we can't mutate it. Right? I'm not saying you have to apply like this, you know, a system like this, but like even start with like small clean tidy checks, small infrastructure that runs across your code base and makes changes. Right? Like be prepared and like convince your organization to be able to change your code. Right? Like that's the first step in kind of making this work. Google has a culture of doing that, so like plugging into that culture is fairly easy, but if your company doesn't have that culture, like that's the first step. Like code should be mutable. So anyway, I am out of time. Thanks for the question. I'm out of time. I'm happy to take further comments in the hall or wherever else afterwards. So thank you very much. <laughs>